Uh, first, th thanks for inviting me to talk today. Uh, my name is Dave Black. I'm a paleoceanographer. And this actually kind of sounds like a start to a bad 12-step uh, process. Uh, what I would like to talk to you a little bit about today is climate change. And obviously, at least certainly to this group, that, that's something that is going to have a, an unquestionable impact on Long Island environments. And I had originally planned on doing a little bit of a discussion about Long Island's past climate, its present climate, and its future climate. And as you can see, uh, in, in retrospect, I've gotten rid of the present section. Most of you have been on Long Island longer than I have. Uh, I've only been here a little less than nine years now, so I guarantee all of you are more familiar with Long Island's present climate than I am. Uh, but I will spend a little time talking about the past and the future. We are, I say uniquely, I'm not sure it's 100% uniquely, but certainly it's a rare situation where we have a range of environments over a very small area under which we can observe all sorts of ecosystems and impacts on those ecosystems, ranging from uh, population pressure with a population gradient across Long Island uh, to coastal influences, be it changes in coastal shapes or erosion or processes along those lines, land use change over the last several centuries. Uh, we can start looking at different environments like woodlands or lagoons or salt marshes. Uh, much, much more. There's just a tremendous amount of work that can be done in such a confined area that it's really kind of amazing. And I'm hard pressed to really think of a comparable location, certainly within the United States, where we could do uh, this type of work. Um, all that being said, Long Island is not unique in the uh, impacts that are likely to be felt from climate change. And a big question is, well, how do we assess climate change impacts? Climate changes on a variety of time scales, ranging from tens to hundreds of millions of years, to hundreds of thousands of years, to thousands of years, to centuries, to decades. So we have climate change operating on all sorts of different time scales. Uh, climate has varied on this planet throughout its 4.6, give or take, uh, billion year history. The mechanisms that are responsible for climate change vary depending upon what time scale you're looking at. We, we can be dealing with uh, relatively long time scales, uh, which are driven largely by tectonic processes, which are really irrelevant for Long Island's history uh, in terms of climate, and it's at least near future. Uh, we can talk about solar processes. We can talk about orbital uh, forcing. Lots of different mechanisms by which climate can be changed. And really the one that we're looking at in the near term is anthropogenic forcing. That's not to say there aren't some other natural forcing uh, factors that could play a role, such as volcanism, but that tends to be a little bit more random in the grand scheme of things. Uh, but these are all factors we need to think about when we start considering the impact of climate change, not just on Long Island, but really everywhere else around the planet. In order to assess climate change impact, we have something of a problem. And that problem is the fact that instrumental records of really whatever climate variable you're interested in, be it temperature, precipitation, sea level, cloudiness, uh, it really doesn't matter. Whatever you're trying to measure with an instrument today, that record rarely goes back more than 100 or 150 years in any part of the world. You know, we're lucky to have multi-century uh, temperature records from instruments even in Europe where we had thermometers uh, more commonly so than, than we did in the United States for a while. And the problem with that is when you're trying to assess climate change impacts on the environment or just climate change for the sake of climate change, your instrumental record is already very likely biased by an anthropogenic component. Uh, depending upon when you want to say humans may have started uh, interacting with climate, and there are some people that suggested that may have occurred as uh, far back as eight or 9,000 years ago, which is an entirely different talk, but. Uh, a really entertaining one. Uh, most people tend to peg the start of human interference uh, with, with climate or human interaction with climate really with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And that puts us back a couple of centuries ago. When you think about the length of the instrumental record, particularly the modern instrumental record, uh, it's much shorter than that. So our instrumental measurements of weather, climate, et cetera, already have superimposed on that some measure of an anthropogenic influence. And in order to assess climate change, uh, 
really what are the natural rates and ranges of climate change, we need to look beyond the instrumental record, and that's where uh, the type of work I do comes into play. Uh, there are all sorts of, for lack of a better scientific term, things preserved in the geologic record that are sensitive to climate change. I work a great deal with marine sediments. If I had to describe, and I frequently do, the type of work that my lab performs is I use the paleoecology and the geochemistry of fossils preserved in the geologic record to reconstruct the physics of the oceans and the atmosphere. And basically that translates into, I know a lot of about a bunch of different sciences, just enough information to get myself in a lot of trouble with people who actually specialize in those individual <coughs> fields. Uh, but within the geologic record, be it marine sediments or ice cores or even something that is, uh, like, like tree rings, there are all sorts of things that are sensitive to climate change. And if you learn how to read those records, we can extract histories of past climate. Uh, just as an example, one that I, I give to my undergraduate courses, uh, most people are familiar with the concept that trees put down rings, and it's not uncommon for people to be aware that you can count the rings to figure out how old your tree is. Um, what most people aren't aware is that you can actually use the width of those rings, just as an example, to reconstruct what climate was like as that tree grew. Plants need a certain temperature range, they need a certain amount of water in which to grow. And when they don't have either of those factors, they don't grow as fast in a particular year. So we can look at a given ring width, and depending upon whether this tree is located in an area that's sensitive to temperature or precipitation, when we've got a nice fat ring, it was either warmer or wetter. And when we've got a really thin ring, that's when it was drier or colder. And you, you can sequence those events to create a history. Admittedly, we're talking something that's very qualitative right now, whether it was warmer or colder. But once you calibrate that to actual modern instrumental data, then you can start being quantitative in terms of your reconstructions. You can say what the temperature was down to, say, half a degree Celsius, or what precipitation was to within um, 10 millimeters a year. So that's just one example of what we call a proxy. Uh, there are many, many, many proxies. Most of them tend to be geochemical rather than uh, something that, like measuring tree rings. But these are techniques that we use to reconstruct uh, histories of past climate on this planet, and the goals of that are twofold. One is just to figure out what was going on. But the second major goal is to try to understand what forces climate to change, what are the different interactions that occur, how do two different regions relate to one another. Um, what I spend a great deal of my time doing, particularly over the last decade or so, has been focusing on uh, climate variability over the last 2,000 years in order to establish baseline rates of natural climate change. Uh, how fast do we go again from one extreme to another? What, what are the extremes? What, from high to low. And if we can do that for the past, we can then look at what's going on today and ask the question, well, is what we're observing now any different than what we've observed in the past? And if so, then anthropogenic climate change becomes uh, less important, and I'm certainly not arguing that. Or is it substantially different than anything we've observed in the past, in which case we need to be paying more attention? The, uh, the data I'm going to show you today, actually, I haven't produced a single point in anything I'm going to show you this morning. Uh, most of my work tends to deal with the tropics and the subtropics. Uh, and for reasons that we're going to get into, uh, you'll very quickly discover that Long Island has a very limited paleoclimate history for uh, some very natural reasons. So let's step back 18, 20, 21,000 years ago when we had a good chunk of ice covering a, a substantial portion of, of the North American continent. We don't really care about Europe in this particular talk. Um, we were really right at the edge of that major ice sheet. I'm sure most of you are already aware that you were sitting on what we call a moraine, a, a glacial debris deposit. Uh, I'm not from Long Island. Uh, I've moved here, as I said, about nine years ago, but I remember growing up as a kid, and I'm dating myself here a little bit, uh, hearing the news about the Long Island garbage barge moving up, up and down the coastline. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that's an event most people would just as soon forget. But it's kind of ironic that in the grand scheme of things, Long Island is really Glacier's garbage dump in the grand scheme of things. Uh, we are the debris pile, at least one of the debris piles, at the edge of that glacier. And as it advanced and retreated, it left uh, debris that had been carried out of Canada in New England and deposited onto Long Island. So really, all the environments you find on Long Island today functionally didn't exist 18,000 years ago. Uh, it, everything has been developed since then. And because of that, the normal climate change for Long Island is one that happens on a 
at least in its history, a pretty regular basis. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of different types of data. I'm going to focus really on a, a, a relatively narrow range of climate variables. I'm going to talk about uh, temperature as much as I can. I'm going to talk about sea level, uh, a little bit about uh, precipitation, and we'll see what we, where we go from there. Starting early on Long Island's natural history and its paleoclimate, really we were a glacial outwash plain with, with a, what today the modern analog would be a tundra environment. We were right at the edge of an ice sheet whose edge locally was probably somewhere around four to 600 feet high in the grand scheme of things. You think about the debris pile that is Bald Hill today and if, you know, how large a, an ice wall you needed to create that. Um, it's hard to be much thicker than that, otherwise we would still be rebounding uh, glacial isostasy, which we are not in the grand scheme of things. Uh, so this is really probably what a good chunk of Long Island looked like 18,000 years ago. Low vegetation, scrub, grasslands, braided channels, things along those lines. Uh, a much colder environment, unquestionably, probably a much drier environment, despite the, the massive ice just to the edge of us, simply because a lot of atmospheric water vapor is tied up in these ice sheets. We're going to jump forward here about 8,000 years. Uh, as I said, paleoclimate records from Long Island are actually very limited in the grand scheme of things. And I didn't recognize that or wasn't really aware of that until the last month or so as I was putting this talk together. And uh, I'm honestly not sure why those paleo histories don't exist. I suspect uh, to a certain extent it's a lack of funding to run out and, and grab materials, but potentially also a lack of opportunity. Uh, there is some data available and shown here is, uh, are, are some data from Oswald et al. where they took a core from a lake uh, out towards the Hamptons uh, and studied the pollen record for the last 10,000 years. There was a substantial depositional hiatus about 4,000 years, between 9,000 and 5,000 years ago, uh, where uh, it appeared the, the lake dried out. Uh, but what we can see is the in the early part of the record, we have a higher pollen percentages of things like uh, oaks and pines, so Pinus and Quercus. Uh, we see relatively high amounts of charcoal in the older portion of the record relative to the more recent portion of the record, and that suggests greater forest fire frequency, again, going uh, or substantiating the, the concept of a drier environment during this period of time. As we move towards the present, we see a shift in the pollen abundances, and there were just more than these two in this particular study. These are just two that, that I, I grabbed from it in terms of Pinus and Quercus. We can see as we really get towards the present, the very top, um, I'm going to take a stab at the laser pointer here, hopefully it won't change slides. Um, there's a shift in the environment, again, towards higher percentages of pines, not quite so much in oak. Um, the authors of this particular study suggested that uh, we reestablished some of the pine barrens post uh, agricultural usage or agricultural aband abandonment, uh, and that some of this is not necessarily anthropogenic disturbance. Whether or not you want to agree with that, we can go from there. Um, if we move even further towards the present, again, really limited paleoclimate, which is kind of nice for me because it gives me an idea for what to do for the next four or five years. Uh, looking at cores from Long Island Sound, and this was a rather extensive study uh, produced by Verkamp and co-authors, including uh, Alan Thomas at Yale, looking at what they found in sediment cores from Long Island Sound. And here's just an example where they're looking at the percentage uh, or essentially mass accumulation rates of carbon over the last 700 years or so, and we start seeing a substantial increase in terrestrial carbon beginning around 18, 1860 or so, a little bit of an increase in marine carbon, and yes, we can tell the difference between the two uh, in cores based on differences between carbon and nitrogen ratios and carbon isotopes, uh, but these clearly reflect an anthropogenic change, uh, very likely a change in land use. When we look at pollen from those same cores, we start seeing a substantial increase in pollen associated with anthropogenic activity, in particular land clearance, so we wind up with ambrosia, ragweed, uh, the sudden appearance of uh, taxa such as those. Uh, very clear anthropogenic input, and prior to that, really the last, again, 700 years or so, not really much in the way that would indicate a substantial climate change. It's not to say there wasn't one during this period of time, but at least not reflected by these proxies. Lots of squiggly line graphs. It's one of the occupational hazards of my field. 
I've got a colleague who regularly asks me, you know, how many Etch-a-Sketches did I use to produce my plots, because we wind up with things that look like this, uh, if not worse. If we look at sea level records, and I'm gonna focus on Long Island here in a second, but I wanna give you the big picture. Uh, if we jump back 125,000 years ago, really the last time our planet was as warm, if not slightly warmer than today, sea level uh, globally, was on average roughly two to three meters higher than present. Uh, if we jump back to the early Pliocene, so going back really four or five million years ago, uh, global sea level, and this was a period of time when temperatures were two to three degrees Celsius warmer than present, which is really what we're projecting for towards the end of this century. Uh, sea level was as much as 10 meters higher than t today. Uh, this is one of the good things and bad things about studying paleoclimate is we can look in the past for modern analogs to get a feel for what we can expect in the future. Uh, the, the, that's the good news. The bad news is you occasionally see things like this, which are more than a little scary. So really what we're looking at here uh, is early uh, Pliocene, you know, sea level today, and we're really looking at, as I said, you know, numbers as much as 10 meters higher than present. We jump back 125,000 years ago, we're, we're talking two to three meters higher than present. So that being said, let, let's talk about modern and future records a little bit. What you're looking at here is a record of tide gauges from around Long Island Sound and Long Island as a whole, so Bridgeport, New London, et cetera. And what we see is an increase in relative sea level over this period of time, and it's relative to the period 1980 to 1989. Uh, an unquestionable rise, and over roughly the last 100 years or so, sea level has gone up something in the neighborhood of 10 inches. I want to emphasize that number because globally, over the same period of time, sea level only goes up roughly 7 to 8 inches, and it turns out we happen to live in an area, for better or for worse, where we experienced amplified sea level rise relative to the global average, and I'll show you other data that supports this. Uh, this study that I'm going to show you is a paleo record uh, by Kemp et al, and they reconstructed sea level based on salt marsh deposits for the last 2,000 years. Uh, so what you're looking at here is essentially the error of their reconstruction of where sea level was, what's what these boxes uh, represent. They overlap the actual instrumental tide gauge records, and there's good agreement between the two, uh, fit a, a model line to it, and you can then essentially take the first derivative of that to get rates. And what we see is the sea level has gradually increased over the last 2,000 years at a rate of about a millimeter per year or so. Uh, it slowed down a little bit. It was still going up, but the rate decreased. So here we're only going up about a half millimeter per year. But beginning around the late 1600s or so, at least for our region, sea level starts increasing to its current rate locally of about three millimeters per year which doesn't sound like a whole lot if you think about it. A dime is about a millimeter in width. But when you add that up over a century or two, we're starting to talk about substantial differences in sea level change. Long Island's sea level history is not unique to this part of the world. Uh, the, th these are essentially detrended records where the long-term slope has been, been removed. Uh, so this, the upper left panel is the data I just showed you, so that, that's our increase. We see a very similar trend for, for records derived from New Jersey, from North Carolina. As we get further south along the eastern seaboard, we start to see uh, a, ch uh, a difference in the way in which sea level rose. Uh, certainly the rates are also uh, uh, distinctly different, so this is a record from Florida. Uh, we've still seen an increase in sea level, particularly uh, beginning around 1800. Uh, but really, the northeastern central part of the eastern seaboard, we experience elevated rates relative to many other parts of the world, and I'll come back to that. Oops, sorry. More squiggly line plots. Uh, th this is a record of oxygen isotopes uh, taken from foraminifera, which are essentially, think of them as amoebas with shells if you're not familiar with forams. Uh, that they are primarily marine organisms. There are some that handle freshwater environments pretty well. By looking at the oxygen isotope composition of the calcite that makes up foraminifera, we can get all sorts of paleo information. We can get information about temperature and salinity primarily. Uh, oxygen 
isotopes is really kind of where this field of past climate change studies really took off, and there, there's a long, interesting history there that I unfortunately really can't get into today. But what you're looking at is a record of oxygen isotopes for the last thousand years from a variety of cores taken through Long Island Sound. Uh, the authors of this particular study interpreted these uh, primarily as being uh, a record of salinity. And we can see Long Island Sound really from west to east had a pretty constant salinity until again the late 1700s, early 1800s and things really start changing. Um, primarily as a result of land use. Right now this is an uh, oxygen 18 space, but if we correct for temperature and just really focus on the salinity component, it, it becomes a, a little less noisy in terms of the plots. Again, we can see salinity really took a nosedive beginning around 1800. This was associated again with land use changes where we had more fresh water uh, I should say less fresh water being able to percolate into the ground and more of it running off into Long Island Sound. Uh, this increase uh, Actually, we can talk about what that increase might mean. But again, the paleo record of at least one climate variable, and yes, ocean salinity is a climate variable uh, around Long Island for the recent past. Much to my kind of horror, this is the only paleo temperature record I could find for, the re for, for really the, the region of Long Island. What you're looking at here is uh, a marine record uh, from Long Island Sound from, again, those foraminifera. And instead of using oxygen isotopes, we were using a different proxy, the ratio of magnesium to calcium in the shell, which is temperature dependent. Uh, this was from a benthic species, so this record is from about eight meters down, and whether or not that's representative of surface temperatures is another story altogether. Uh, but what you're looking at here is what is functionally a temperature record for the last 2,000 years. Uh, we see an increase between roughly 900 to 1200 uh, AD or so, which is consistent with an interval we call the medieval climate anomaly. Uh, we no longer call it the medieval warm period simply because depending upon where you are in the world, things didn't get warm. Some places actually got colder uh, during that interval of time. It's really a misnomer that unfortunately cropped up early in the literature. Uh, Climate unquestionably changed over that interval of time, but not everywhere responded the same way. We happened to respond in a warming fashion. Uh, this interval of time between roughly, you know, let's call it 1400 uh, through 1900 or so is an interval referred to as Little Ice Age, when much of North America and Europe experienced colder temperatures. Uh, the Little Ice Age, if you dig into the history of that event, actually occurred in two phases with a little intermediate warming. This occurs later than we see in most records in terms of the warming, but you do have the two-phase uh, Little Ice Age and then uh, very distinct 20th century warming. Uh, that warming extends a little further than I would have expected for the Little Ice Age, uh, but given the number of data points and the robustness of this technique, it's hard, hard to argue uh, that the data aren't valid. Whether or not it's representative of the region or just this particular core is another story. So that's kind of the present. Uh, with that in mind, let's talk about the future a, a, a little bit. Um, when we look at what, or when we make projections, I hate to use the word predictions, because they're just connotations that have built up around that word that many of us prefer to avoid in this field. When we look, talk about what climate is gonna be like 100 years down the road, it's really based on two things. Uh, the first is that analog situation I mentioned with regards to paleoclimate records. The second is based on computer models, and uh, Let's just get this one right out of the way. I'm preaching to the choir here in all likelihood. It turns out that climate models, particularly over the time scale of interest, actually do a reasonably good job in the grand scheme of things. We're not talking about weather here. Uh, th this is a figure showing in black the, the average uh, instrumental temperature record for the various locations. In blue are, is our climate model reconstructions of temperature uh, for those regions without including greenhouse gases as part of the model. Uh, in pink, fuchsia, however you want to describe this, is the computer reconstruction of temperature for the various regions once greenhouse gases are included in the models. And you'll see they actually consistently do a really good job of hindcasting. And in the grand scheme of things, if the model's successful hindcasting, uh, with a certain amount of confidence, we can run the model forwards now and be reasonably confident in the results. Uh, there's no question there's a, there are some problems in the models. When you look at the global Records, you'll see a, a misstep, particularly in this interval of time between instrumental data and the model data. It's not an issue with the land modeling, it's clearly an issue with the ocean model for that period of time. 
That's not bad news. It gives modelers something to focus on. They realize that there's something in the models that isn't being done correctly. But overall, uh, certainly on century timescales, the models actually do a really nice job of capturing uh, what climate has been, like, at least one aspect of climate has been like over the last 100 years. Just to drive this point home a little further, um, this uh, paper was published by Jim Hansen, ex-NASA scientist in, in the late 1980s. Uh, and his model projected what temperature would be like out to roughly 20, 20 or so under different emissions scenarios, uh, with a high emissions, a medium emissions, and a reduced emissions scenario. The black line is uh, instrumental, the black and red lines, I should say, are instrumental uh, records of temperature. And you can see they match his model actually pretty nicely. The paper was published in 1988. And here's what temperatures have done for the future. And they've actually tracked the models really, really nicely in the grand scheme of things. And I want you to think about that for a second, because think about what the state of computers was like in 1988. I was still running uh, major pieces of research equipment with punch cards in 1988. Uh, so in terms of the ability to put together a climate model that was, has done a really nice job on, under much less sophisticated uh, systems than we have today, should give you an idea of the competence of, of the climate models that we currently have. So with that, let's look at some projections for the future. And let's start with temperatures. These are IPCC projections. You're more than welcome to look these up on your own. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with these things. I'm going to focus on the Long, the Long Island portion of these records. So in this case, the area uh, circled in black. Uh, there are two figures here for what temperatures are likely to be at by the end of the century based on different emission scenarios. This emission scenario is essentially if we drop uh, CO2 emissions back to roughly pre-1990 levels uh, by the end of the century. No one honestly expects that to happen. Uh, but we're still looking at something in the neighborhood of about one and a half degrees Celsius increase if that's the case. Under a truly worst case scenario where emission rates result in atmospheric CO2 levels greater than 1,000 ppm by the end of the century, which again is, pro is extreme, no one really expects this either, we wind up with as much as four and a half degrees Celsius warming over Long Island. The reality is somewhere in between. Admittedly, it's probably closer to this end than to this end. Uh, atmospheric CO2 was measured at 405 parts per million earlier this year at the Mauna Kea Observatory in Hawaii. Uh, so we're certainly pushing into that without any problem whatsoever. It wouldn't come as any big surprise to hit 500 ppm or so by the end of the century. But these, this is the range of temperature increase we're looking at. I'm not an ecologist, so I can't really tell you what the, the implications are for that temperature increase. But for those of you who are and are familiar with the effect of small average annual temperature increases over extended periods of time, something to think about. In terms of the seasonal distribution of that temperature increase, this is really the same plot. Well, actually, it's not the same plot. Slightly different perspective on it. Here we're just looking at the latter part of the century uh, based on a scenario that is closer to splitting the difference between the two I just showed you. And for our region, we're looking at, you know, so, and this is in Fahrenheit, not Celsius, but you know, here we are, seven degrees Fahrenheit change in winter temperatures, seven degrees Fahrenheit or so change in summer temperatures. Uh, I, I put this up in particular because what you're not seeing here is a change in seasonality. Both the seasonal extremes are expected to increase by the same amount, and that is not the same really for a good chunk of the rest of the country where there is a distinct difference between winter changes versus summer changes. And as someone who deals with seasonality in the tropics, uh, it can have a major impact on your long-term climate. So in terms of what's going on with us locally, it might be a little easier to figure out because we're seeing an equal distribution of that temperature change. In terms of precipitation, uh, again, same set of models, uh, low emission scenario, high emission scenario, reality somewhere in between. Uh, without really getting into numbers, essentially cooler colors on these plots represent wetter conditions. And in both scenarios, we're, we're looking at greener here, so we're looking at a wetter environment. Uh, if you want to interpret stipples versus slash lines, stipples are where more than 90% of the models are in agreement. Uh, the, the, Horizontal lines are where the models don't denote any statistical difference from natural variability. So very low uh, emissions scenario, we essentially see variability or projected variability within the natural range of the climate spectrum. But towards the high end, we actually start getting outside that for a good chunk of the planet. 
In terms of you know, focusing in on just North America, again, uh, greener colors here represent more precipitation, and we're looking at probably a greater increase in winter precipitation than we are in summer precipitation overall. Um, the good news is we are also gonna have warmer temperatures, so with the way Long Island tends to deal with snow, maybe it won't be such a problem, even though things are likely to get wetter. And then there's the 800-pound gorilla in the room, sea level, which is what most people tend to think about in terms of the first impact of climate change. In reality, globally, it's freshwater availability that's probably going to challenge us first. Locally, sea level is likely to be an issue. Here is a record of global uh, tide gauge and eventually satellite measurements of sea level change dating back to 1880. Uh, and again, we're looking at something in the neighborhood since 1900 or so, about seven inches of sea level rise locally, I mean globally. Again, locally it was closer to 10. Uh, when we look at projections under different emission scenarios, we're looking at something between, uh, let, let's call it a third of the meter, a, a fourth of a meter or so upwards uh, of three quarters of a meter or so of sea level variability globally. Uh, in terms of the increase, and that's largely due to a combination of thermal expansion of the oceans and melting of continental glaciers. When we look locally, though, uh, there's something of a concern. When Sea level is as big a misnomer as anything you'll ever run into. There is nothing level about the ocean. Sea level varies across an ocean basin by as much as several feet. There's a couple of foot difference between the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. If you open the locks in the Panama Canal, you'd wind up with a 40 knot current through it that would run for a couple of decades, at the very least, before the Pacific and the Atlantic uh, equilibrated. But you know, what you're looking at here are changes in sea level based on different emission scenario. And what you'll see is not you know, different colors around the world, not everywhere increases by the same amount amount, and just focusing in on this one for a second, or this one because it's a little easier to see, you notice that we're kind of in a hot spot, so to speak, in terms of sea level rise. We're going to experience a greater amount than the global average. Uh, again, this shows up in historical records of sea level, relative sea level change over the last century, where we see a greater rate of sea level increase in this part of North America uh, than actually many other parts. So when we talk about an average increase in sea level of something in the neighborhood of two to three feet globally, we're going to be on the high end of that locally. And when we superimpose, if we take a digital elevation map of Long Island and superimpose a one meter sea level change on it, everything in red is underwater. Uh, so you know, the barrier islands, you know, when you're talking that's kind of an increase in sea level, it really doesn't matter what kind of sea walls you put in or to prevent erosion, you're going to lose it eventually. Uh, all along the north shore of Great South Bay, we're, we're talking uh, some problems. Uh, I didn't bother with the three meter or six meter projections simply because by the end of the century those are completely unrealistic, but down the road maybe not so unrealistic. Uh, already, you know, during uh, high storm surges, we're, we're starting to push things at Kennedy Airport and LaGuardia uh, with an additional couple of feet of sea level, that's an issue. Uh, one other thing I, I want to mention just before finishing this up uh, is storms. If you want entertainment, well, it depends on your definition of entertainment, I suppose. But if, if you want something that can be really entertaining to, to watch, go to a conference on climate change where, where there's a special session on hurricanes. And you know, grab a beer and some popcorn and just sit back and watch the, the, the fireworks go. Because right now the scientific community is pretty divided into two camps. So one of which feels that uh, hurricanes really haven't shown any change in behavior uh, based on climate change over the last century or so, and then there's another camp that says, yes, they have. Uh, not that we're seeing more of them, but they've become more intense. This is a record of hurricane tracks uh, since roughly 1850 or so in the Atlantic, uh, and you know, no surprise, Long Island is you know, clearly in here somewhere under all of those. Um, but I want to draw your attention to one in particular, Sandy. A uh, storm we all come to know, love, hate, et cetera. Uh, I've been through five hurricanes, and I don't count Sandy as that, because when we made landfall here, it was tropical storm strength. I've been through the eye wall on two of them. I was just no 10 miles north of the, the eye wall in Andrew in 1992 in Miami. Um, well, Sandy was destructive, it, it, you know, it could have been much, much worse than it, than it was, which is kind of scary to think about. But perhaps a little more disturbing to think about, and I really don't mean to end the, the, this talk on that kind of note, uh, is Sandy was characterized as a once in a thousand year storm. And you, we don't have a thousand year record of hurricanes, so what's that really based on? Um, 
I've got colleagues who, ever, who, who try to answer that question. And this is a study that uh, came out about a year and a half ago now. And what, you're, what is shown on the, the plot on the left here is a record of storm surge associated with Sandy uh, for our part of the world. Uh, what this person did is they took some sediment cores in, in a, a back pond. Uh, this brown area represents the moraine. The numbers represent the height of the storm surge in meters from Sandy. These are the core locations. Uh, the, this is a p picture of the, the lake before Sandy. This was taken six days after. Uh, you can clearly see beach sand that had been uh, moved off the beach and towards this pond and into it in many cases. So what the authors of this study did is they looked at beach sand deposits as uh, indicators of past hurricane variability. And people have done this all around actually the United States at this point, but let's just focus locally. Uh, and what they see here, just to cut to the chase here, is here's the sandy uh, overwash sediment pattern. But we go back to 1821, and here's another peak in uh, grain size of almost comparable amount. Uh, and it's a case of you, you can have two 1,000 year storms in less than 200 years, and we can call it 300 years if you want to go back to the beginning of this record, but it really calls into question the frequency of these events. Is it really a once in a 1,000 year event, or is it you know, really a once every 500 years or more frequent than that? We can't say that without these type of records. So just to quickly conclude, you, you can read these you know, for, for yourself, but you know, Long Island environments are formal under the best of circumstances. Uh, when we look into the future, we're, we're looking at warmer and wetter, uh, more rain has all sorts of implications, not just for freshwater availability, but for stratification of Long Island Sound. Um, sediment transport, you know, don't buy a house on the South Shore. Um, <laughs> if you do, get storm shutters, because you might be experiencing storms more frequent than, than we've thought, and I'll be happy to take questions in the limited time I've left you. Thanks. <laughs> okay, we have time for one question. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> To what do you attribute the sea level rise locally starting about 1600 on? That was before any anthropogenic effects. Um, sea level rise globally has increased uh, over that interval of time. It's not just us. And as I said, that's largely due to a combination of thermal expansion and melting glaciers, little ice age aside. Uh, in terms of why we get it a little worse here than elsewhere, that has to do with the large scale overturning circulation of the Atlantic. And when we start having changes in that, the, the conveyor belt circulation backs up a little bit and we tend to unfortunately catch that back up. Real quick. I'll make it so quick. Thank you for coming. Do you, uh, sorry if I missed it, why is Long Island seeing higher sea level rises compared to other locations? Uh, actually, that, that was uh, the, the latter part of that. When we look at large scale ocean circulation, we have water sinking in huge quantities uh, south of Greenland. And in order to replace that water, we have water coming up via the Gulf Stream, the North Atlantic Drift, that brings water and heat to the north. If you have weakening in that conveyor, and that has been observed actually uh, over the last century or so now, but uh, during other intervals in the recent past, uh, the, the water that is coming up to replace it has momentum. If you, if you weaken what's sinking, it doesn't stop the water that's coming up, but it slows it down, and the result is uh, things tend to mound up. Gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, David.